where somebody I love is ready to have neck surgery for a disc problem, a spine problem. The question is, should I have anterior cervical discectomy infusion, what they call ACDF, or should I go ahead and get this new thing my doctor is telling me about that preserves motion in my neck called the artificial disc? ACDF or artificial disc? That's the question today. I'm Dr. Dan Lieberman. I am the medical director at Phoenix Spine and Joint. I'm also a neurological surgeon. We do all kinds of joint surgeries at the center joint as well as spine, but uh, I personally have done over a thousand anterior cervical discectomy surgeries. I'm no longer an active surgeon, but during my time, although I was involved in the clinical trials for the artificial discs when they came out in the early 2000s, I didn't put any in. And the reason I didn't was I said, hey, we gotta wait. We gotta wait and see how these things age because when you look at the total hip or the total knee, those are implants that move. And those implants can develop problems over time. We have brilliant scientists, brilliant engineers, but everybody gets it wrong sometimes. What if they get it wrong in the kind of metal that they used and now, a few years from now, we're having to remove all these things. Let's wait and see what happens and find out. We know from mobile prostheses, mobile implants, that there is even some debris that is released through these implants, and that debris can go in the blood and affect your health. So are the artificial discs gonna do that? Are they really gonna maintain the range of motion that is the reason we did them in the first place? And are they going to be just as good? Are patients gonna like it just as much? as they did the anterior cervical discectomy infusion surgery that we've been doing since the 1950s. These are all legitimate questions and I'm here today to review a research study with you which sheds light on quite a few of the answers. This paper called Cervical Disc Arthroplasty, 10 year outcomes of the Prestige LP cervical disc at a single level by Dr. Matthew Gournay and his colleagues. These uh, folks are in uh, all over the country. They're in Missouri, University of Virginia. When a new product is coming to market, the FDA, the Food and Drug Administration, requires that studies are done by the product manufacturer to make sure that it's safe and that it's at least as good, and of course preferably better, but at least as good as the thing it's replacing. So when this particular uh, brand of artificial cervical disc came out in the early 2000s, the FDA required them to do a trial. And what we're seeing now is the results of that trial 10 years out. So this is really powerful data and it gives us really good uh, information that we can use to answer a lot of these questions about artificial discs. One of the first questions that we had that a lot of doctors asked about artificial discs is, well, are people going to like them just as much as fusion? Because fusion seems to be doing great. Our fusion patients were extremely happy with the operation. It was very rare that one of the neck fusions didn't take, and it all seemed to be good. And there was kind of a general sense of, well, why do we need this artificial disc when you already got something that works? Well, this trial has shown conclusively that when you look at the um, satisfaction that patients have with the operation, and here I'd like you to, I'm gonna show you what is figure two in this research publication. We can see that the patient satisfaction for both the total disc arthroplasty, that's the artificial disc, and the ACDF, which is in dark blue here, are extremely high. But at two years, five years, seven years, and 10 years, uh, up to 91.5% of people are completely satisfied with the artificial disc. And similarly, 85.6% definitely are mostly satisfied with the ACDF. So the two are, are very high. The artificial disc actually a little bit higher than the anterior cervical discectomy infusion. But not when they do a statistical analysis, it wasn't enough higher that it was statistically better, but it was higher, it wasn't, it wasn't any less, that's for sure. So that's extremely encouraging that, yeah, people really like these artificial discs. And we didn't do a huge mistake. We, we gave something people like at least as much as the ACDF procedure. Well, what about motion? Because one of the main motivations for patients going into an artificial disc is, well, am I gonna keep my, my range of motion? Uh, the answer is yes. Now, this study was of patients who had an artificial disc at only a single level compared to a fusion at a single level. But when we look at those two groups, look at their preoperative motion 
and then their motion at uh, two years, five years, seven years, and now 10 years, we see a tremendous disparity. And by the way, motion was assessed by x-rays. They had patients look down as far as they could, then look up as far as they could, and then they looked at how much angular motion there was between the two, measured very, very carefully with a computer. What they found was before surgery, in both groups, the motion in the artificial disc group amongst those patients was uh, about 5.67 degrees. When you did it in the um, ACDF group, it was about 7.87 degrees. How come they're not exactly the same? It's random, you know, they're close. You took two groups of people who were selected at random, and so one's a little bit different than the other, but it's not significantly different. Well, what we found then after the surgery, the range of motion in the artificial disc group, which went from 5.67 actually went to 7.51, it increased a little bit. That's fantastic, because when you consider the range of motion in the fusion group went from 7.87 to 0 0.35, 0 0.3, so less than, less than one. So it, went, it almost went away completely, which is what we expect, right? That's interesting, what's, what's even more interesting is that this range of motion continued, the range of motion gain continued all the way through the 10 years. Conclusion from that, well, you know, yeah, you got better range of motion, but it's six degrees. So yeah, it's better, but how much does six degrees mean to you? That can, you know, I'm not sure. I think if you're a person who really, really values that range of motion, you're on the younger side, you're really active, you're involved in sports or other activities, team sports or individual sports, that cause you to move your neck quite a bit in one direction or another, that might be significant. So that's something that, that could matter to you. And the artificial disc is definitely better. Second thing really interesting was uh, what they called adjacent level. The bones in the neck are numbered one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. If we treated the disc between five and six, a few years later, patient might come back with four and five or six and seven, the one above or the one below. Because they were the next door neighbors, that was generally referred to as the adjacent level disc problem. And one of the great hopes of artificial discs was that they would reduce this adjacent level disc problem by maintaining the range of motion at the level treated. And it makes sense, right? It, the idea was, well, if you fuse two of them together, you took away a shock absorber, and now the lever arm and the motion of the what was the two is now one, it's gonna be much harder and it's gonna beat up the one above and the one below. Well, interestingly, when we looked at the uh, follow-up at two years, five years, seven years, and 10 years, it really didn't turn out to be the case. The incidence of reoperation, which means how many patients had to have another surgery, in the 10-year follow-up on the artificial disc was 13.8%. That's an important number because when you have neck surgery, you figure you're one and done, but you're not. You're 13.8% by 10 years of, you know, almost 14 out of 100 people are going to have need to have had another surgery for one reason or another. Similarly, uh, the ACDF group at seven years was 10.9%. So we would have expected the ACDF group to be higher, but yet we see only three years later, the artificial disc group is at 13.8. So long story short, um, you know, I don't think, I think people want range of motion, people want to have other issues, but if you went into artificial disc surgery thinking, well, I'm gonna preserve my adjacent segments, it didn't work for that. So that's not a good reason to think about it going forward in the future. Well, you know, ACDF's been done since the 1950s. Artificial disc is much newer. Us doctors, we don't like new things. We like what we know for sure works every time. So all kinds, and our minds just race around with all kinds of theoretical risks. What about the debris? When you have the metal on metal, the, the orthopedic surgeons learned with the hips and the knees, there can be a debris that can even get into the bloodstream and cause metal poisoning. Is any of that happening? The answer is at 10 years, no. The blood measurements were taken of the metallic levels in these patients, and yeah, they were a little bit higher in the artificial disc group, but not enough higher to be of any concern. This problem, by the way, in the artificial joint world, in the hips and knees, has also been largely solved. The new implants that they have give off just a minimal, minimal amount of metallic debris, despite the fact that these are very, very large joints compared to the implants in the neck. So, you know, that doesn't seem to be a problem. You can put that out of your mind. It shouldn't affect your decision making one way or the other. I guess this is a long way of saying it's a dead issue. It's really, really not a problem. Well, um, what about breakdown? You know, anything that moves can break. And when the, when the hips and knees came out, no one really knew how long they were gonna last. And so we used to tell people, come back when you can't walk anymore. We'd want them to be as old as possible. They don't do that anymore because they know those implants now last 
uh, 30, probably more years. What about the artificial disc in the neck? How long is it gonna last? We don't know for sure, but at 10 years, it's going strong. Almost none of the implants have broken down due to technical or mechanical reasons. And you can say, oh, well, you know, they're all gonna start breaking at 20 years and 10 years isn't an indication. Things usually work where if it's gonna break down, some of them are breaking down faster and some of them are gonna break down slower. So if it was gonna start breaking down, we would expect to be seeing now the early ones, the ones that are breaking down the fastest, and there, we're really not seeing that at 10 years. I didn't put any of these in myself because I wanted to wait and see as a surgeon. I thought, I thought, hey, I'll wait 20 years, uh, and if they're good at 20 years, then I'll start putting them in. Well, it turns out the artificial disc outlasted me. But having said that, I think if I were operating today, seeing how good this data is at 10 years, I'd go ahead and implant artificial discs if a patient wanted one. They don't seem to be breaking down. They're showing strong signs of preserved range of motion. They deliver on what they advertised for, and so I think you can feel comfortable. Uh, long story short, okay, which one should you have, artificial disc or the ACDF? I think based on these data, I would say there's certain kind of patient I would really recommend you strongly consider and think about that artificial disc. You really care about that range of motion. You understand that there could be the need way down the road to have some kind of revision. That's not gonna be the end of the world for you, but you're probably not even gonna have to do that. And you want the best of the best. The results were not significantly better than ACDF surgery, but they were better. And so if you want that little extra edge, then I would say you should do an artificial disc. There's another group of patients who say, you know what, I don't wanna try anything until I know for sure how it's gonna work. Give me the old tried and true. I'm gonna have one surgery in my life. I don't want any possibility of having two. By the way, if that's your attitude, you shouldn't have surgery because there's always a possibility of needing another one. But okay, if, that, if you wanna minimize that risk and eliminate that unknown, and you want the old tried and true that worked for everybody you know, ACDF. The truth of the matter is you got two options and they're both good. I wouldn't lose too much sleep over this one. If you think about it and it's bugging you and you can't come to the right uh, conclusion, contact us here at Phoenix Spine and Joint and we'll hold your hand and hopefully walk you through it.